the only activity with any intrinsic and absolute worth, said Ram Dass, is that of becoming more conscious. Okay, well, if you're a Zen master, maybe you can tell which of your students are more conscious, but how do the rest of us know? Well, we can measure their brain waves, the EEG. Indeed, both Samadhi and Satori, the superconscious states in yoga and Zen, which are associated with incredible bliss and happiness, Satori and Samadhi, are characterized by huge alpha waves all over the head. Hmm. If I was a teenager, I'd say, brain waves rule. Yes. Yes, brain waves rule your emotions, they rule your thoughts, they rule everything about you. And indeed, when you can change your brain waves, you can change everything about yourself. You can change your whole life. My research also shows that when you change enough to transform, you actually inspire, incite, and maybe even cause transformation in those around you, which could be family, friends, and co-workers. It is clear that higher consciousness is contagious, and I trademark it as protagious. I've worked with all sorts of people. U.S. Army Green Berets, San Francisco 49ers, kids, students, parents, grandmothers, grandfathers, European royalty, Indian chiefs and shaman, Zen masters, CEOs of billion-dollar companies. How did I get here? Well, my childhood was highly disrupted. My dad taught music for high school and later college bands and choirs, and we moved a lot. I could not form lasting friendships, always moving, new towns. I learned early on that many people will judge you based on where you are from, not who you are. Why? When I moved from Wisconsin south to Louisiana, and then Arkansas, I was discriminated against as a damn Yankee. Well, two years later, after living in the South, I'd picked up a Southern drawl, and I moved back north to Illinois, and now I'm discriminated against as a Johnny Reb. I'm from the South. So I learned early on that culture and even identity are not real. They're not real. They're made up. They're arbitrary. And this discovery turns out to be very important for my work later because when you become, in your core identity, a happy person, all that takes is a shift in your brainwaves. In the summer between eighth grade and high school, my dad said to me, Jim, you're a smart kid, and you're probably going to want to go to college. But I'm here to tell you I'm not going to give you a dime if you want to go to college, you'll have to study hard and get a scholarship. And so my entire, that was a huge change for me. The, my entire four years of high school became a learning quest to get good grades and get a scholarship. And I got that scholarship. Even though there was no drinking in high school, there was no partying, there were no dates, well, except for senior prom. And so I got that scholarship to Carnegie Tech for physics. And one day on campus, I saw a big hand-lettered sign that said, Dr. Joe Camilla will talk on brain waves and consciousness. Brain waves and consciousness. Well, I went to the talk. And the talk was beyond fascinating. After the talk, I arranged to correspond with Dr. Camilla and at UCSF. And in the summer, after I graduated, I told him I would go out uh, to see him, visit him, work at his lab. So when I graduated, um, I got on my Triumph motorcycle, vroom, vroom, and I rode from Pittsburgh through Canada out to San Francisco. And there I volunteered as a research subject in his lab an old house at the edge of campus of UCSF. He put a few electrodes on my head, 
and put me in a closet off a former bedroom that now held the big PDP-15 mini-computer that ran the brainwave feedback. The closet had sound tile on every surface. It had a upright wooden armchair, and it had a small table that held a box containing three Nixie tubes, old vacuum tubes that could light up and show three-digit numerical scores of my brainwaves. In the left corner was a big torn speaker sitting naked on an upturned orange crate. This was the most advanced lab on the planet for brainwave feedback in 1967. Then, in that lab, I had three consecutive days of alpha brainwave feedback, about an hour each day. And, of course, on the fourth day, I wanted more. So I went back, uh, but they weren't doing any studies that day. Oh. So I looked up Joe Camilla's girlfriend, Joanne Gardner, who worked in the lab. And I asked her if she would put a few electrodes on my head so I could go in the chamber and play. And she said yes. She put me in the feedback closet. Uh, she closed the door. She started the big computer. She went upstairs. She got involved in her work. And she forgot me. <laughs> Hours later, she went out to Chinese lunch with nine other members of the lab crew. And it was in course number 11 of a 12-course Chinese lunch where she remembered that I was in the chamber. So she and the nine others jumped into the VW camper bus, hurtled back across town, rushed into the building, ripped open the door, and interrupted the late stages of a most incredible adventure. When they opened the door, and there's these 10 people standing there, they could see that I was clearly altered. I was altered. And so they asked me, well, what happened? Well, whew, I had discovered other worlds. I floated out of the chair. I flew around the universe. I had powerful out-of-body experiences. I explored other universes. I had strange experiences like... I had strange experiences like going into altered states of consciousness, having awareness without thought. I met non-physical beings. Some of them were scary. And so this was my transformation. It was totally real, but it was unlike anything I had ever experienced before. I had changed my brain waves through technology and my reality had changed profoundly. I was the original biohacker. I didn't know it yet, but this was my first discovery that brainwaves rule! The lab crew listening to me said, oh, these are meditation experiences. Hmm. Well, I decided to register for psychology grad school because I figured I'd be working with weird stuff. And I wanted to get my rational brain certified with a PhD in psychology, kind of like as a stamp of approval, so people would take me seriously. Right after registering for grad school, I walked up the hill and I met with Dr. Rolf von Eckertsburg. He taught phenomenology at Duquesne University, also in Pittsburgh, and he had been a grad student under Timothy Leary at Harvard. So I figured maybe he would know what had happened to me. I talked, he listened for three and a half hours. When I finished, he folded his hands, smiled and said, we can do this here. In that instant, my world changed again. In that instant, I realized that this was my vocation, not just something cool that had happened to me, but rather it was my job, my life, my spiritual work, my profession. Indeed, it was my vocation. The psych department, where I had just registered, had one soundproof chamber and a pile of old electronic equipment that I knew I could cobble together into a brainwave training system. And so I did. And I ran my first 
research study with 20 students right there in the Carnegie Mellon psych department. And I found that when their alpha brain waves went up, their anxiety went down, both trait anxiety and state anxiety, and they became significantly more happy. So, in the last 49 years, this has been my life. Research, publishing, making the technology more powerful, more accurate, learning how to guide people on ever more magical journeys into their own mind, developing, leading, advanced trainings. Now, in my own training centers, BioCybernaut of Germany, BioCybernaut of Canada, BioCybernaut of Arizona. And so, I offer you that, in conclusion, remember, the only activity with any intrinsic and absolute worth is that of becoming more conscious. And change your brain waves, and you change your life. Because brain waves rule! <laughs>